Hello everyone, welcome back to the Craft and Business of Books with me, Tatiana Denford. And I'm Marissa Ozzy. This is the show that brings you all the tools, the tricks, and the stumbling blocks to the writing process, but also it gives you the behind the scenes perspective from the industry, which is super hard to find. We're gonna try and cover everything, all of that, everything in between, um, you know, to give you guys basically the information that you need to try and make the book world a little bit less scary so that you can get your book on a shelf. So we're on every Friday, 2 p.m. Eastern, so make sure to click to subscribe below and be alerted ahead of every broadcast, and thanks for joining us. So what are we talking about today? Oh, today we are talking about what happens when your book starts to gain traction very quickly and ends in a successful auction. So that thing that we keep saying doesn't happen to everyone, we're gonna talk about that when, we're gonna talk about that. <laughs> when it happens, yeah. Um, when it does happen, uh, you know, there can be a lot of energy and hype over a very short period of time, particularly if it's happening during London Book Fair. Um, so this is a major industry event, right, where deals tend to get lots of buzz at happening around them because people from all around the world are all, you know, within one, one small space in London. And of course, you know, New York, uh, New York has a, a similar event. But in my experience, LBF is a, it's a bit more of a thing. Um, and perhaps that's because of all of the rights deals and all of the, the countries being so close together and coming together on this, you know, on, on that side of the world, this, like I still live there. Uh, that's a little bit something, something extra. So what we are talking about today is how do you stay calm and maintain a rational, humble train of thought when your book is getting lots of attention before you officially find a publisher, maybe? Exactly. Um, you know, how does it feel when your book is part of a huge auction? You know, do you temper your expectations or is it impossible not to get swept up in it? I think it's wild. I mean, I think it's a, a little bit nuts to kind of conceive of the fact that you're sitting here writing something that is really solitary, it's really private, it's your thing and you you love doing that. It, mm -hmm. And something happens and it hits the industry in a very particular way and, and suddenly the train leaves the station. Mm -hmm. And nowadays especially, now also with social media, I think everybody expects instant gratification and everything expects things to happen yesterday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a bit of a storm. And if, if there is so much noise surrounding something that you've only kind of regarded as your own, mm -hmm. how do you conceive of that process? How do you not get caught up sure. in the hype? Because it's, I'm sure it's really easy, right? I mean, gosh, wouldn't it be great to just kind of walk around and go, I have this book deal, I have a super agent. It could really easily, understandably, get a bit, Kind of ridiculous to manage and also do you start walking around like you're everything or or do you kind of you know keep yourself to yourself and go well you know this is what i want to do you just focus on the work rather than everything surrounding it sure you know? but then that's you know i don't that's just my perception i think i would find it really overwhelming but then you have to have people around you that may kind of help ground you and mm -hmm. help you stay sane <laughs> Of course. And I think there's the extra uh, consideration there where you may not be physically present for all of it, uh, where, you know, with something, especially at, at London Book Fair, where the entire industry is in, you know, inside uh, Olympia in London, and yeah. you're, you're probably not there, you know, as an author, especially if you're a debut author, or, you know, it's with your first or second book, you, you might not have any presence there because, it's, you know, it's a lot of just you know, business, it's a business, you know, it's a business to business event for the most part. Yeah. So, you know, what if all these conversations are happening and you're not even there? But you know, what's interesting is that because you're approaching it from this kind of slightly the, the business mindset and you're seeing it that way, I, I would just be really protective over it. Do you know, I would just look at that and go, well, just no, don't touch it. It's like, don't know it's mine. But then you want to get really excited that people want it. But at the same time, you're like, Oh, you know, it must be really nerve-wracking. It's a really strange moment, I'm sure. So typically we would talk a little bit more about this from our perspective first, but this is absolutely something you really need to hear from the horse's mouth. So we're going to focus on our guest who has been through this firsthand. And I'm, I'm super excited because Leah, to me, is the girl next door of the book world. She's super sweet and down to earth and really grounded. And I, I just think 
you know, she puts out so much good energy and she's like a machine the way she writes. The way I mean, I, I know I'm going to embarrass her by saying that. So when we bring her on, but I'm just really inspired by somebody who's so committed to their work and their process and their writing, no matter what, you know. So, yeah, let's bring her on. Hi. Hello. Hi, hello. Thank you for having me. This is lovely. This is so exciting. I love it. I can't wait. So, Lee, I'm going to do a very short introduction before we get into right. our questions. Perfect. So, you have written two novels so far, right, that have both been published by Treppies, which uh, is an imprint of Orion, Somewhere Close to Happy, and Dear Emmy Blue. So, on that note, I'm going to hand it over to Tatjana to ask about some more of, the, more of the creative questions, and then I'll get on to the boring industry things. <laughs> <Perfect>. oh, yeah. <laughs> um, right, Leah. So, again, thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to start with something that probably, you know, you always talk about in the beginning with any interview is what you're working on right now. Um, I'm working on book three, um, which will be book two to the US and various other places. Um, but it's my third novel. Um, and that is just a it's kind of very similar, obviously, to my other two, but it's probably the most romantic one I've written. And it's all about, oh, why, when people ask you what your book's about, they always say, get a pitch ready. But I, I don't know how much I can say. I have the pitch ready, but if I say it, I might not be allowed to. But it's um, a romance about, it's two people that meet in a really unusual, unromantic, way but I'm hoping I can make it romantic they meet in kind of really unusual way um, and it's about destiny and about if you sort of it, it sort of explores that if I take this road what happens to that life that goes off there and can one choice change the whole trajectory of my life basically and that is what it's about so yeah it's um I'm, edi I'm editing at the moment so my head is oh, in it, yeah, and I'm heebie-jeebied up. <laughs> just, oh, wow. I'm at that point where I'm like, save, it's all rubbish, save, it's all rubbish. Oh, no, yeah. Like, that horrible stage I think that you get to when you're about two thirds of the way there that you think, well, my deadline's almost here. So I now no longer have time to just go, oh, sod it, I'm gonna change it all. Um, so yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, so that's what I'm working on at the moment. So things oh, that's so exciting but you know and when you when you started working on this was it was your aha moment the the kind of seed that kind of developed into the story was it different this time around than your first book or, yeah. or okay so where where do you kind of go that's it that's the that's the idea that's how I'm going to develop it's really hard and I won't lie because there's so many things that will they flutter in these little things that you think that's interesting or that sounds like a cute story or even if you see someone I always say this but like someone in the street with a good face like they might have a good face and if it's a hot guy I'm like who's he yeah. going to? <laughs> not that I want him I I think <laughs> that sounded a bit weird but yeah I, I my brain is like a rom-com film all the goddamn time so I'm always looking at people like who's she waiting for on that bed? <laughs> questions all the time and I'm answering my own questions with my own stories so sometimes there will always be there's always flutters of stuff and I don't know which thing is going to be the thing that settles but usually for me it's if something doesn't leave me alone um and if I can wake up the next morning and I've not thought about it I and mean, I look at the notes thing on my phone where I write all my weird little ideas and I think oh that's really good god like thank god we didn't send that to the agent going I've got a good idea um <laughs> But, yeah, I think it's when it won't leave you alone and you have this feeling in your tummy of like, oh, I don't want to leave this alone. And sometimes it doesn't make sense, but you still can't get rid of that feeling in the pit of your tummy. And oh, I'm trying, you know, I, it was a song and I can't remember what song it is. So that's really bad. But it was a song that helped me come up with Somewhere Coast Happy. I had the character of Lizzie, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do with her. And then... I heard a song, I can't remember what it is, but I was like, oh, and that stemmed me thinking about what would you do if you got a letter and that letter was actually dated 15 years ago or 20 years ago, what would you do? Yeah. That was the thing. Um, but the balloon for Emmy Blue I'd had for years, like what would happen if I let go of a balloon and someone found it and wrote to me or what would happen if that happened to somebody? But that was all I had. And I thought, well, it's cute, but it's not enough. Um, yeah. 
And then one day I remember where I was, I was sitting on the corner of my sofa like this, half asleep, and then thought, and then I can't say what it is because it might ruin the book, but then it came and I was like, oh, I think that completely, I've got it, that's it. And that was magic. Whereas this one, again, is different. It's still a thing, the thing that is the same, I think throughout is a thing that doesn't leave me alone, but it's kind of different in the way that it's taken me quite a long time to work out what this story is trying to be. I've gone down this road, I've gone down that one, and now I've chosen this one. And of course the demons are like, <laughs> On down path A. On the <laughs> path yeah. Yeah. You just change the character names. You've got another book, right? That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. Exactly. And there's always the next one. Exactly. But um, yeah, so I think it's when it doesn't leave you alone and you have yeah. that kind of butterfly belly where you think, oh, yeah. I can't wait to find out what this is going to be. Um, and I think you know quite instinctively what is the thing that. Mm -hmm because you've got to love it you have to love it you don't sit your bum on the chair and do it so yeah but I think you know, it'll it'll show through your writing if you don't love it that's the thing that's obvious you know that's the thing that's obvious but also in I'm I'm noticing a pattern when we speak to authors and ask them about kind of the these kind of moments and how it develops yeah it seems that the author's voice also is very it goes hand in hand with how they develop the idea. So for you, which is really interesting, the way your idea develops is a very romantic way. It's these ideas that are whispering kind of slightly, kind of like next to your shoulder going, you know, try this. And I think that your books have that in them. They have a sense of intimacy and, you know, there's romance and there's like really you know, good face. Your books give good face too in your character. Good. <laughs> Can't be a good face. <laughs> but then, um, so, and once, so once you have that idea, how do you then, do you kind of write willy nilly? Do you kind of write notes to yourself? Do you sit down and kind of, or do you have a specific routine? How do you carve out time? Because you have little ones. So, yeah, three you know. of them. Um, Oh, it's hard and I I'd love to say that I'm really orderly but I'm not and I try to be I am a I'm a disordered person <laughs> trying to be orderly and it just doesn't work I can't um with Emmy Blue I wrote it in such I made myself ill writing that book because I just left it to the last minute because mm -hmm. I was so bogged down with fear I was absolutely I was frozen with fear I just was and then it got to the point where I thought well it's due and you know the story in your head and the times that my brother would come around for dinner and he would be like in the kitchen and I'd be like, I need to talk to you about my book again. He'd be like, okay. <laughs> and then I'd tell him the same synopsis <laughs> I told him every time I saw him until he said, it's all there. Just, it's yeah. so perfect, sit down and do it. And of course I was telling myself, I'll do it when I've worked out this bit or I've yeah. worked out but actually, in hindsight, I see that I just actually needed to sit down and I just needed to get on with it. And that is what I did. And I did, I didn't clean. And I say that, like, I can laugh now, but at the time it was like, we don't have a fork. <laughs> and there's not a clean fork. When my, my other half would get home from work and I'd be like, could you just wash up some forks? Because we don't have any. And I just put everything on hold and wrote. And I did make myself ill where I wasn't going out. I wasn't sleeping. Yeah. I learned from that because I thought you can't a you can't do that again. Yeah. B, it wasn't good for your head. And number like and three also like it was fear all along, and this will keep happening. And I know my my mind, and I know how I tick, and I know that this is going to come every single time to trip me up. Um, so I do try. I don't sit down to write really until I know how it's going to end, and I know. Um, I filled out a bit of a beat sheet of, okay, well, this happens in the middle. I think this would be really good to happen here. Um, and then I try to just sit down every day and write, I don't know, 1,000 to 2,000 words. But I had to let go a long time ago of, I'm only going to write these words at my desk with a cup of coffee and quiet because it just it just doesn't happen. So I have to do it on the phone. I sit on the loo while the kids are in the bath with my laptop. and I just think even if I've got a thousand words on that, a thousand words on that, I can stick it all together at the end and just make sure yeah. that 
it's for me. And I filled out, I had an interview today um, and someone said like how basically a very similar question. And someone said to me ages ago, and I can't remember who said it. So I don't remember the song. I don't, this is how my mind works. <laughs> Clearly, I'm just enough. Half of it is kids. Half of it. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. 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 Um, but he said to treat my writing like my treat. And that really helped because wow. instead of it being an hour on Netflix or I don't know, like a hot bar or whatever it is at the end of the day or even the beginning of the day before everybody's got up, it will be, no, come on, you deserve this. Because yeah. for a lot of, I think, writers, the, the thing that's in the way is always mostly, and I know that people have got full-time jobs and so much stuff going on, like life is busy. But I think for me, at least, it's mostly psychological anyway, yeah. from my experience. Yeah. And I think it's what you're, what that is telling you when you treat it like a treat, you know, it's positive association. It's you're sitting down and not forcing yourself to create because I find that I find that I completely close up as soon as yeah. I, as soon as I am giving myself permission to just enjoy and just not kind of criticize or self edit what's coming out, then there's no pressure. But then, you know, I, you know, but what's interesting is that you have somebody who has now, you're working on your third book. So you have two books under your belt. I think it's going to be really surprising. And I'm excited really for people to hear this because people assume from the outside, oh, she's got a formula. She's got, you know, there's no fear. She's fine. She has an agent. <laughs> you know. Yeah gets worse and I really I don't like to say that because it's almost like if someone had said that to me I'd have gone well I'm just giving up then <laughs> I, I told myself that I would be I'd just be happy as soon as I got an agent I'd be happy I'd be fine and then I didn't it got worse and I was like maybe I need a book deal <laughs> and then I got a book deal and then it ramped up even more and then of course I got more like foreign deals and then it got even worse and that was when um I mean, it, it was just before that, actually. It was just before Emmy Blue, because obviously my second book was is the one we're talking about today. But that I, before then, I was fearful. So, of course, when that happened, it you'd think you would walk around going, oh, my God, this is amazing. But actually, I went the complete opposite way. And I'm quite comfortable with saying that. I don't think I would have felt comfortable saying that a while ago because I couldn't understand why I wasn't jumping around for joy I was I bet it was fear again and for me that is that's my biggest obstacle and I think I'm working on it and will probably always be working on it but it's everybody feels it and the more you talk to and there's people that I have spoken to that I have looked up to and said like I, I, I was talking to an author that um at an event and I said you know, just got to get rid of these nerves. And she said, oh, they never go. And she's yeah. like, how many books in? And I was like, oh my God. Um, but it's true. Um, but I think if you make peace with it, I mean, Elizabeth Gilbert has got a whole book on it, Big Magic. I don't know if you know it. Mm -hmm. It's honestly, it's, I listen to that book like I listen to, almost as if I would call my mum. If I'm having a wobble, I either call my mum or I listen to Liz Gilbert and that sorts me out. But I think, People wait for the fear to go. Or when I feel ready, or when I when I'm better at it, or when mm -hmm. I'm always waiting, and I just don't think I don't think that time ever comes because I'm still waiting. Yeah. And that's, and it's quite common. And I think more and more people are like starting to be comfortable talking about that because we were talking to somebody the other day that said those voices never go away. Um, you know, and the the bigger, like you were saying, the bigger the pressure gets, the wow. harder the harder it is for you to kind of let go of that. And like it's a it's a constant battle because you're like, well, now I have to produce. Now what? Everybody's watching me. Now you know, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it is. It's like you're gonna get found out, or you say if you only had two books in you, you might not have a third one. Who knows? And then. I remember thinking it was even worse with the first one because with your first book, I didn't have an agent. So it was all on me. I just thought if I can, if I want to pick it up to write, I will. If I don't, I don't. No one's going to be bothered. And I think with your first book, you sit with it for such a long time and you come up with different ways to do things. Oh, do you know what? I've, and I've done 50,000 words of that. I'm going to delete half of them. And nobody cares. And with that, you 
because of that, you sit with that idea, you sit with those characters for years sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you sign a book deal and they're like, it's a two book deal, you're so happy. But then when it actually comes to writing the second book, you're like, well, I don't know any other characters. I only know these ones. <laughs> I've been yeah. with them for seven years or whatever. Um, so yeah, it is. It is, um, it's something I don't think I saw coming because I have, I had been waiting for, I don't know, like to feel like I belonged and to feel like I am allowed to be an author. I am worthy of being here. And I thought that would happen when I had a publisher in front of me saying, we love your work, we'd like to sign you. When actually all, all that turns to then is they've made a massive mistake. They've made a mistake and they're gonna find out and then they're, I'm going to be like on the front page of whatever. <laughs> the it's, like, it's, like, it's, like sometimes, it's like sometimes you think, oh, like book reviews. Like for me, I was, I think I was talking about this the other day. I think it was on Instagram. I said, they're just being polite. Like they're, they don't really like the book. They're just being polite. Like <laughs> pick one. Or what did I say to um, my boyfriend once? And he always quotes it to me when I'm having a wobble. I said, I think Juliet signed me because she felt sorry for me. And so when. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like I don't know that I'm like an orphan dog and she thinks, well, you know, once a year I should take one of <laughs> Oh no. Oh, you know what? Yeah. I think Juliet would go, that doesn't really make for good business though. So <laughs> and I have told her that. I'm always saying to her, I feel like a competition winner again and she finds it hilarious. But it's um yeah it's just weird you feel like as I say and I think everybody will feel like I'll be fine it will be fine when I get to mm -hmm. when I get to and actually I yeah. I'm starting to think <laughs> not overly convinced because I think if I was Ian Rankin or someone like that I might feel but I still think you feel the fear I just do yeah I'm not sure Ian does but <laughs> <laughs> I love Ian Rankin he's just like the ultimate cool like uncle of the book world I just feel like he has all the answers and one day I'll find Ian Rankin and say please tell me everything's gonna be okay and he'll be like it, it will Leah and then everything will be fine but yeah I think um maybe if I ever got to Ian Rankin's stage I might feel a little less fear but up until this point it's actually just mounting so yeah that's me being really honest about and, that and I think Marissa is probably going to kind of touch on some of these things but I think you probably need good people around you then to kind of help you or help, you know, you can kind of battle with those demons, but you know, luckily you probably have people around you that go, shh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they probably get, so they never tell me they get bored of hearing from me, but yeah, I do pop up in many friends text messages or, you know, poor Ben's asleep at night. And then I'm like over the bed, like Ben. And then he'll <laughs> turn around like, what's wrong? And then I have to say, yeah. Do you think everything's going to be all right? Do you? Oh, and always like, yeah, we'll be fine. <laughs> Go back to sleep. But yeah, that it, even though he's quite passive and he he doesn't stand for it, he just can't be bothered with it because he's like, oh, this again. That mm -hmm. helps me. If ever he was to sit down and seriously mm -hmm. say to me, well, actually, like I don't know, I would lose my, I'd lose my head. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's kind of that is so helpful and just doing normal things and when. And I find it really interesting that when I go to a book event or something really cool, I mean, I went to my publisher's office and I saw David Nichols and had an absolute meltdown secretly. Oh. In front of him, I was very much like, oh, it's David Nichols handing in his manuscript. Inside, I was like, dead. <laughs> and then I went home, had a complete, like, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to me. But all I want when I do those things is I want home and I want, yeah. okay, that's enough glitz and I love it and I feel absolutely honoured that I get to do it. But actually the thing that grounds me is getting yeah. home and, I mean, I was telling my friend the other day that when I got my first foreign deal, um, I checked my email like freaking out and then my daughter called upstairs, I need you to wipe my bum. And I was like, and this is my yeah. life. Yeah. It continues. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, having people around you that just remind you kind of like where you end, like where the books stop and you begin and you don't, it, just because, for example, you have a rejection or an agent requests a full manuscript and then says, eventually, I'm, I have to pass. It's hard. That, it's so hard. And I have been through that. And I remember it felt like, the end of the world because it's like someone has your dream in their hands and then you're like you're so close and you're like just 
you just need to move one step further and then donk, it's gone. Um, that is so hard and it can be so difficult to sort of say, this is not my self-esteem. This doesn't have, this is not Leah, this is your book and it's not yours, it's separate from you. Because I think it's so easy to go, well, I'm just going to let that affect my self-esteem now and I'm going to walk around and feel really crap about myself mm -hmm. and feel like a failure and feel, you know, underconfident and all of those things. I think one of the things that you, you raised that's so interesting is that your first book you are sitting with for so long and you are sitting with those characters and you are, it's just you, right? It's you and yeah. you know, in this story and you have, there's no expectation that you're gonna finish it at a certain time. There's no expectation that you're going to do what you said you were gonna do at the start, you know? Of course. And then you get to the place where you have a bunch of people, hundreds of people <laughs> expecting a second book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and you know, what if you do change your mind? What you know, what if what if things don't don't end up going the way that you think that they're going to in the story? And that's it's just a, it's a whole new set of fears to deal it's, with. Because you write for yourself and yeah. I remember watching this Anne Rice video where she says, and I love Anne Rice, she's so her, like she's just Anne Rice and that's it. Like she mm -hmm. just doesn't care. And she said write the book of your dreams and that was something that really helped me she said write the book that you would like to walk into a bookshop mm -hmm. and pick off the shelf because if you if you really want to read it you're really going to want to sit and write it and that for me changed everything so I was like well I don't care what's selling what's on the shelves that's not why I'm doing this I want to write because I can't not I, I've always written and this but I want to write a novel and I'd messed around as I said with Lizzie who was my main character in that book for ages and I'd had bites at the cherry with an agent but then I it was always like the power was with me because as soon as they would reject it I'd go well I can turn this into anything I want to I can write another book I can do this so yeah it's like that book was that I think that was the hardest book to put out there versus Emmy because that was so much of me in that book mm -hmm. and I can tell you where I was when I wrote, wrote certain chapters. Oh, I can remember that I was at the osteopath with my baby who wasn't well when I wrote that chapter. Like I've got so many, like I can tell you where I was, but with Emmy, I just know that I wrote it in a mad <laughs> frenzy of fear. Right. But um, yeah, so that is actually, it is hard and you don't, it's almost like you see, I just saw the agent as the, the box to be ticked and I did not really think beyond that. I yeah. just, uh, that's I because I, I was so like so hard to do and yeah. I just thought I you know I don't know if it's gonna happen so we'll just aim for the agent and then when that happened the book deal happened about three months after that so that was really I'd only just got my breath like oh god I've got an agent yeah. <laughs> only had a book deal and I was like oh my god it's real now and yeah it, it is really it's it is a whirlwind and I just think a sort of not for the faint of heart like mm -hmm. it's for everybody but if you're like me and I am faint of heart you do. <laughs> I do feel like you get caught up in the tornado of it, and then suddenly you're absolutely burnt out, and you're thinking, yeah. Yeah. "I'm feeling like this because I should be feeling, I should be elated." Mm -hmm. um, actually, I'm just, as I say, it's fear for me is my my big obstacle. Yeah. Yes, yeah, like someone's suddenly going to call you and say, "Oh no, I'm sorry, we've made a terrible mistake." Yeah. Yeah. Every day. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, if you're happy to talk a little bit more about that, I would love to know a little bit more about how all of the rights deals happened, you know, for uh, for Dear Amy Blue, because, you know, it, was, it yeah. was, you know, reported in the bookseller. I, you know, I know what those uh, those days can look like, sort of leading up to London Book Fair and throughout London Book Fair. And, you know, a deal that would be big normally is suddenly just under this mega spotlight. So can you tell us a little bit about what that felt like? Were you there? Were you at, were you actually there? Were you sitting at home? Like I you know. was at home with my kids. Um, I'd had a mad um, period of time writing it. I wrote it really quickly. Um, I did have a really meticulous plan. Um, so I spent a long time planning. Um, and I wrote in really like a passionate frenzy of love and fear and shit, is this going to work? Like I just, I was like, I remember my friend knocking to pick my, little boy up for school and she just looked at me and was like are you all right and I was like, you'll be done soon I, was like, I don't think I will be she's like 
it was awful. Um, so I finally, um, I, I, I got to about halfway and I had total fear. I was like, oh God, I, I just, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know, think this is good enough. So I sent it to Juliet and I said, complete honesty, because I always just try to be honest. Like, I don't know. I've written this and I don't know if it's any good. Do you think I'm headed in the right direction? Um, so she read it really quickly. She was like, Leah, this is really good. Get it done. And I'd like you to have it done by the end of February. And I was like, oh, that's fine. And then deep down, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do it. But I did. Um, as discussed, <laughs> made myself quite sort of mad in the process. But um, I got it done by the end of February. And then I think the book fair was middle of March. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought I'm going to have a really relaxing March. I'm just going to do nothing. <laughs> I'm going to just relax with my kids. I'm just going to you know, take walks, feed the ducks. I'm going to do really nice things. Um, and then about a week later, I got a phone call from Juliet saying, you've got a German auction. And it was so fast. And I just was sitting in my bathroom, I had a leaking bath. And I remember sitting on this leaking bath like, I just want to get a new bath. Please let this auction get me a new bath because that's what I wanted. Um, and so then that, that kicked off. And then I had about two weeks of just countries um, just offering. And it was it was absolutely insane. Like I'd check my email and there'd be another. And it just, be I became completely separate from myself. It was like I was doing it from above or something. It was really, I was not processing it. I wasn't, I just thought it just none of it seemed real it all just felt like and I was so tired from yeah, yeah. I, I hadn't got my breath from that um but it was amazing like the whole time it was happening I was thinking I'm gonna look back on this when I'm an old lady and I'm gonna say Jesus Leah like you did something really cool yeah day 32 year old Leah as I was then <laughs> I was sort of going like oh autopilot we'll just walking the kids to school and then coming back yeah. home and having a cup of coffee cleaning the house and then checking my email like we've had another bidder and like oh amazing because you're not there and so it just feels like mm -hmm. it's gonna happen I don't think it's gonna happen yeah. and of course you don't understand that once it's started it, it does happen um and then I had lots of phone calls like I remember I had a speech therapy class with my little boy that I was so stressed out about, so worried. And then I had to leave early to take this call with Simon and Schuster US. And the whole, it was like two worlds colliding and it was mad. It was, it was honestly mad. It's one of the best things that's ever, ever happened to me. And I feel every day there is, I mean, it's a year and a bit on now and I still wake up most mornings and I still think I actually can't believe that happened to me because it's me like I'm just I'm not Ian Rankin <laughs> well, he's the I go to because it's like I don't know I just he's got everything but it's it's um yeah it, it felt completely it just did not feel like it was happening to me I felt like I was in a film I felt like I was in the Truman show I just thought this is crazy but it, it was chaotic and beautiful and yeah I felt every single emotion and you know do they not re you know do they not realize that I I don't do conference I've never done a conference call before but of course you then get on the phone and you think oh, they're just normal people yeah, yeah it's um it was it was big it was and it happened very quickly and it wasn't even a toe dipped it was just yeah. held and dropped and it was, it was, it was, it was exceptional. I, I will never forget it, but it, it was a crazy, crazy time. Do you think, if I can ask you, do you think that you compartmentalizing the experience? So you saying kind of you separated your, you have your life, but you also had this kind of alternate reality that was happening. Do you think, do you think doing that helped you not suddenly feel overwhelmed? I think, I mean, I, I think so, because again, what helped me was, I'd have my freak out and definitely like I wasn't all just stress. I was, I would have my moments of jumping up and down going, oh my God, I can't believe this. And then I'd go, right, well, it's bath time and bedtime then for the kids. Like it was, and that was the thing that anchored me. And I think maybe if I had been alone and hadn't had everyday chaos to be getting on with, I think yeah. maybe I probably would have spiraled. And it's, it was just, it was just something that I, 
I experienced, so I'd have a freak out and then I'd go, right, well, come on, I've still got to go to Tesco. <laughs> still got to go to Tesco, yeah. get whatever for dinner. Um, so yeah, it was worlds colliding and it did help, I think, yeah. in hindsight. I didn't know how to handle it at the time and I felt very lost because I didn't know how I should be feeling. I didn't know if I should still be feeling this enormous amount of fear that I was feeling. Yeah. So I was like searching for a kind of outlet to feel safe um but i think my kids definitely kept me and it's nice because it's so, it is two separate worlds and yeah. i have my off and i'll go to a book launch and oh, it's lovely and then i get to come home to he won't go to sleep and he's taken <laughs> pajamas off or whatever and then i'm like okay back to it and upstairs yeah, I go. yeah um i don't want to take you down a peg like a toddler oh god and you can't keep clothes on a toddler like to yeah. do clothes. <laughs> yeah uh, um, so the one of the other things that's that's interesting about about the first book is that your editor uh, it was it was her first acquisition right it was yeah, well, yeah. I, you know we've talked a little bit in in previous episodes about you know kind of the matching of agents and authors and publishers and and authors and how you kind of come to that how you find the right person for you. Yeah. Right, and I think it's it's particularly interesting um, to, to hear from you about, you know, what was so special about about the proposal? What was so special about the plan? What felt right about the relationship with your editor when that was her first time? Yeah, um, it was. I mean, I did see another editor, another place, um, but I just and I, that was a big thing alone. I worried about that, like, who do I? How do I know? And I remember. Um, my dad said you you'll know like you'll know and it, it's almost like when you walk into a house you know when you, you're kind of looking for that's how I felt I thought oh no my god and both of the meetings were amazing and it was really hard but I think with Katie Katie was very um oh, she was just lovely which they both were but she had written me a love letter in the style of the love letter in the book number one <laughs> which I was a bit like oh because that's just like I don't know like stuff of dreams and she had read my Twitter feed that said <clears throat> that I love mini eggs. So she had a packet of mini eggs on the table. And I was like, you've got me. <laughs> it's chocolate. <laughs> yours. I'll sign on the dotted line. <laughs> um, but it was talking about, I think it, it, when we talked about the book, she just, she got it entirely. Like she understood the humour. She understood kind of the sad parts. And she just understood what the book was trying to say. And I just walked away and I thought, I've, I think it's got to be her and um I just I always try to make decisions like who can I imagine how can I who can I not imagine saying no to and but yeah I think you have to it's all gut instinct for me yeah. if something feels because I think when I was looking for an agent I was very much like, I'll just take anyone because you you just want to be published it's just you just want someone to see what you see almost yeah. in your someone to say I know exactly what you're trying to do and I'll get your book out there and that's what you've got to worry about and that's what I had in my head and what I kind of learned was you can there can be a bad relationship and I haven't yeah. experienced this but now I'm in it I think say if I had chosen someone that actually I wasn't 100% sure about what anyway because it was the only offer yeah. and now it's a really it's a bad match and this yeah. person wants this for me but I want this and they're not willing to hear me out mm -hmm. um, I think the same goes for publishers and Absolutely. it's okay to say and I I am learning this and I know this it's okay to say no if even if it is the only one that is saying yes to you it's okay to say my yeah. gut's okay with this and I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna write something else or I'm gonna go out with someone else and see if it works somewhere else because it's you hear all the time oh you know it's it's such a small percentage it's such a small percentage that you can't ever imagine having to say no to somebody but I think I was very lucky in that I I did meet a couple of other agents and then I also met Juliet and I had my pick but I, the reason I wanted to meet them was because I just thought I need someone that is gonna I can sit opposite <laughs> and be mad and say I'm really worried and have them calm me and have them understand and not I, I didn't ever feel like the person I was working with would never get me um, and yeah it's it's um I think it's really personal. It is a personal thing because it, you're sort of handing over your career to somebody, and that is 
that's so important. It's just you have to be able to sit in this room and feel like, I, okay, I, I trust these people as much as you can in a situation like this. Um, so, yeah, gut feeling, again, and just instinct and asking the questions. Like, ask the awkward ones. It's fine if you can. Something I'm learning again, like, am I allowed to ask this? And Julia's like, yeah, like, go for it. Um, so, yeah, and remembering that also they're like, they're people that's something that sounds ridiculous but I have them as these and you yeah you've worked in publishing so I'm sure that you know it's like almost like they're these gatekeepers and they're not like they are just people who have books yeah. <laughs> people talk about publishing like oh my god I'm like, it's me you realize it's like <laughs> <laughs> No, no, Marissa, Marissa, you might turn people off by saying that. I don't know. <laughs> I should I should say actually most people are not. Most people are much, much more no, but, way cooler than like way cooler. <laughs> What's interesting is that as adults, we have to set up our own emotional boundaries to adult in life. And I think if you're producing something that's kind of out of your brain and it's really personal and you're being really creative, I think it setting up boundaries around your work in order for it to flourish, that is your prerogative. And I think it's really difficult for people to understand how to do that. Because like you were saying, people just want to be published. So they're like, yeah, okay, no, 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 it'll be fine. Whoever says yes, it'll be fine. I think it's wonderful that you're learning kind of as you go. And I think it'll help other people watching this going, it's, it's okay to say no. It's okay to say, I don't gel with this particular person. And ultimately, you know, we, Marissa and I were having this conversation the other day where from the other side, agents, publicists, editors, they also have to set up boundaries. You know, they also have to say, actually, like there's nothing against you. I just don't feel like I'm the right person to kind of carry you along on this, kind yeah. of thing, you know? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's true. And it's, um, I think that's, but you can only learn it as you're going, like as you come to these yeah. situations, you will, you will learn and I just think being honest with yourself in all of this and trying not to get swept away like sometimes I have to sort of center myself and say okay where are you in all of this and what is it that you want and what is it that you would like to ask and what is it that you're worried about and instead of because it's very easy I think with writing because you're you're on your own all the time and someone like me I am I'm introverted I like being at home I'm a home bird so that works for me but also at the same time you can you kind of get lost in your own head and you can just I don't know work yourself up into a frenzy and, and worrying and should I should this be happening I wonder when that's going to happen when actually if you're just honest with yourself and just ask the difficult questions to the publisher mm -hmm. is this person or I'm concerned about this um, and that's why you need somebody that you trust and you like because if you're afraid of your agent mm -hmm. <laughs> which I can't imagine anything worse because yeah. Juliet, bless her, gets her in, gets me in all forms, but um, she gets the worst of me and the best of me. But I think you need to have someone that you trust and you can be yourself with. Um, I think that just applies to agents and publishers. And it can be so tempting to just go, well, this person's offered that and it's not ideal, but I'm going to take it because if I say no, like nobody else, you know, I might not get anything else. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. Yeah. So I think you have to sort of keep yourself and your values and who you really are at the center of it I think at all times as hard as that is sometimes yeah that's great. right great advice thank you yeah so right we, we've reached the part of the show where we ask now really hard hitting questions oh god okay <laughs> so the first one I would like to uh ask which is if you could do anything else for work what would you be doing oh my god I, do you know, I think about this all the time. Um, I think like cooking, doing some sort of baking or I don't know, there's something romantic to me about waking up at like 4 a.m. and going to the bakery and, and baking bread ready for the day and just like me alone in a kitchen, um, alone again, as, as I have to stay, just like <laughs> I when I write. Um, yeah, not too many people around. Um, and just, yeah, something to do with food. I like cooking and I like baking. And to me, it's more like, sometimes I don't even eat it, which my mum always thinks is absolutely ridiculous. She's like, I don't understand why you've made this cake if you don't like it. And I just think, well, because I want to build it and I want to make it. And I love the process of slow whisking. And just, and it's really good, I think, 
to be in your head, isn't it? With yeah. sort of like, I mean, you, you just described some kind of movie scene. Like, honestly, the way you described that, I could see, like, you know, powder, powdered sugar in slow motion. Like, <laughs> oh, I love it. Maybe I'll write a baker. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, is there something that you could share about yourself or maybe your, or your writing process, right, that people might be surprised to know? Oh, God. Um, Anything, like music you listen to or, you know. Um, I wrote a lot of my first book on my phone. Maybe that would surprise. Yep. Wow. Um, yeah, I I remember being. I'd, I'd had quite. I'd had a twin pregnancy, so but it was a it was a lovely pregnancy. I was really lucky with um, the twins. Um, but I had my create. I was so tired all of the time that my creativity sort of took a bit of a dive bomb. And then as soon as I had them, it was like the lights had come back on. And I remember laying in maternity ward like. Would it be mad to start writing a book then? But I was so like, yeah, it was. Um, but I remember just the creativity was back. And when they were about sort of six, eight, seven, eight weeks old, I thought, oh, I really miss it. I really miss writing. And so, but what I'd notice is that I'd be laying with these two babies on here and I'd be I'd spend about eight hours on my phone. So I think, hang on, I managed to have eight hours on my phone because they were here all the time. Yeah. So and I'm really fast at texting because I'm on my phone eight hours a day on Instagram and Twitter and all of that. Yeah. Um, but I just thought maybe I could start writing on the notes app and it doesn't need to be perfect, but at least I get it out. And I remember the first day I wrote like 2,000 words and I was sitting there like, I've got newborn twins and I've written 2,000 words. Like, it was mad, absolutely <laughs> crazy. But that then sort of, I thought, well, if I just do that every time I can and then I can, and it helped me clear my head and it helped me have that lovely purge that you have when you're just desperate to get some words down. So yeah, I wrote a lot of Some Like I Was Happy on my phone and half of it probably didn't stay. I think I probably wrote about 30,000 words on it. Um, wow. I would just finish it and email it to myself. And my email was just a jumble of <laughs> random scene there. I was like, I don't know where I'm going to put that. But um, yeah, that that. That's my weird bit of information. No, that's that's really impressive. I think I, I wouldn't recommend telling people to write books on their phones, but I want to, no. No, but but I love that that's your commitment to what you're doing. You know, you're just there when it's on, it's on, you're doing it in any way you can. I think that's great. This is why I call you a machine. <laughs> I'm I'm honestly, I'm as I say, disordered and some days I can procrastinate a whole day away. Like today I have said, I'm gonna do this whole new chapter that I'm really excited to write and I haven't done it. So there we go, there's the polar opposite. <laughs> I am not a machine. Yeah. I mean, I may look like one, but most of the time, like today I just, I was laying on a sun lounger for like half an hour and in my, in my head I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You've got a deadline in September. And I was like, but I'm really tired. <laughs> <laughs> that's the balance yes exactly you have to have the balance but yeah um no. but machine, thank you i don't feel like a machine but um no um, it's, it's really inspiring and then the last question i'd like to ask which is a really tricky one and a lot of people have kind of struggled with it uh what is your desert island book you are only allowed to pick one. Oh my god this is really hard <laughs> um, i don't know um and this is a really hard question. I should have prepared. I don't know how. Um, I think maybe a Louise Renison book, Angus Thongs and Perfect Snogging. Have you? Um, oh, my goodness. I haven't read that in ages. I've read those books, all of them, over and over and over again. And I remember, honestly, and I, this, I've got them and they're beaten and old, but they make me laugh so much. And when I'm just feeling sad, I will pull out one of those books. It doesn't matter what order. I don't care if it's in the middle of the series or the end. And... I will read that and plus I just she's just I'm not there's no but nothing like that book to me and I think it's because you always remember those books don't you those yeah. books you read when you were a teenager yeah of course so yeah I would take them yeah. which one just give me just any <laughs> any of them <laughs> oh that's a great that's a great answer I like that one Lee, thank you so so much for answering oh, our questions so so lovely uh it's been really really great. it's been really fun and also like i think you've really helped people see you know so many different sides to the writing process but also somebody who who kind of wants a bit of sanity while everything crazy is happening uh you know and there's i love that you're creating this kind of 
balanced energy, which is, yes, I do all of this, but also I am just like everybody else. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just doing yeah. it alone, which is great. Exactly. And I wouldn't have that any other way. I really, really wouldn't. Um, it, it does. It keeps me grounded. I, I mean, I don't like being woken up in the middle of the night, but then it's also, it's like a reminder, like, don't believe your own hype, Leah. Like, <laughs> not that I ever have. I've like, never had and I never would. But yeah, those, those middle of the night, mom, I think, oh, there yeah. I am. Like, there's the real me. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much again. And um, where can we find you so that when people watch, well, how? Um, yeah, Instagram or Twitter. I live on social media. I shouldn't, but I do. <laughs> um, yeah, every, I know I always beat myself up about this. Like, you really should get your screen time under control. And then I'm just like, but everybody's, on, everybody's at it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so Instagram, um, Leah Lewis, author, and Twitter, Ellis for Leah. Cool. Thank you again. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. That's that. Oh, that was so lovely. Oh my goodness. Um, you know, I think it's just, again, we always kind of recap the episode, but I think just like seeing somebody who's really real behind the scenes is so helpful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, because you can have something amazing that happens to your work and everybody's celebrating you, but there's a real person behind it who has a personal life, who has days where kind of she feels so much fear and she's really kind of, you know, like wildly amazed that this this is happening at the same time. So, yeah. All humans, everybody, all humans. I know. Thank you so much to everybody who joined us today. Um, remember to click on the link to subscribe. We are on Fridays at 2 p.m. Um, and yeah, it's been so great having you all here. See you next week. <laughs>